Welcome to CS4510. Uh, the topic of today is going to be uh, circuit lower bounds, or rather I should say lack of circuit lower bounds because we can't prove anything. Uh, we're failures, circuit lower bounds, or lack of circuit lower bounds. We don't know how to do anything. Um, circuit lower bounds, let's, before we talk about circuit lower bounds, let's talk about upper bounds. So we're concerned with, uh, given an explicit Boolean function, what, can <coughs> we, what kind of circuits can we estimate have a certain size of them, right? We talked about uniform time has, you know, unif has poly excuse me, uniform t efficient time has efficient circuits, right? But let's consider uh, a non-uniform model to a non-uniform model. Let's consider Boolean functions. A Boolean function, again, is, takes on n bits and outputs one bit. And you should really think of the Boolean function as its truth table. We are given an arbitrary Boolean function. We want to be able to encode this Boolean function into a truth table, excuse me, into a circuit. So given an arbitrary Boolean function, uh, we want to first do an upper bound. So first we're going to argue that the circuit, given an arbitrary Boolean function, it has a circuit of a certain size. Every Boolean function has, Boolean function has, a circuit of size. What do we think the size is? Estimate for me. Two to the n. Uh, on n bits? Two to the n? Yes. Uh, in fact, the one we'll prove is worse. We'll prove n to the two to the n. n times two to the n. Okay? Now, I'll talk, after we do this proof, we'll talk about the optimality of like, can you do better than this, right? So this is just one proof. Given a explicit Boolean function and a Boolean function, again, think of it as the truth table, we're going to construct a circuit that computes that explicit Boolean function. So non-uniform to non-uniform, right? Again, so where do we start? Well, we got to start with the truth table. That's what a Boolean function looks like. So what we're going to do is take the truth table and write it down like this. Let's suppose we have, uh, let me get my diagrams perfect here. Let's suppose we have a, um, okay, let's suppose we have a Boolean uh, function uh, uh, represented as a truth table, and it's going to look like this. Okay. You arrange the rows in a certain way, and we are going to wire up to each row of the truth table a small subcircuit, such that that subcircuit will only light up if the inputs to the Boolean circuit are exactly that row of the truth table. Then we will have two to the n wires, such that one wire lights up per possible input. Now, if I were to use this using our standard and or not gates, it would look something like this. Here's our jellyfish. If the truth table row is supposed to have a not, what I'm going to do is simply is supposed to put a, a negation here. And then the rest, I'm going to, if it's, it's supposed to be a 1, I'm not going to put a negation there. Okay. Here's such a device, and then I'll add one more. Okay. Now, if I put such a gadget with an, with an appropriate uh, several not gates on the level, convince yourself that if I add one of these circuits per row of the truth table, that this wire lights up if and only if that exact row of the truth table is exactly that row. Right. This circuit will only turn on if these eight bits are one 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 zero one zero. Right. Now I do that for each row. Now, I have a several wires. I have two to the end of these little wires, and I need to make one output of our circuit. So what I'm going to do is do a giant, and, uh, a giant OR gate tree such that I'm going to wire it up to the circuit, to the OR gate tree, only if this is a 1. So for example, if this row was a 0, I'm going to not wire it up. But if this row was a 1, then I will wire it up. So if that row is a 1, this circuit will light up, this wire will light up, 
then this is going to be an OR gate of several wires of corresponding to the rows of this of this of this uh, circuit to any of those having ones in on the last part of the truth table. This is going to output a one, right? And this is going to be a um, OR gate tree, several OR gates deep, right? How many OR gates do we think we need here? I drew I drew one big OR gate, but how many do we estimate? Probably would be needed there. The yeah, like well, if n is the length of the input, if n is the length of the input, n you do need yeah, you need two to the n plus two to the n minus yeah, okay. So you need like approximately two to the n there, okay? So we have one. Let's first off, do we agree that this is a correct construction of a Boolean circuit given an arbitrary truth table of size two to the n by n? Do we agree that this is a truth, do we, do we agree the circuit construction is correct? OK. Um, what is the size of this? So this is going to be like 2 to the n. We're going to have, so it's going to be like 2 to the n. This is approximately how big in terms of n? How big is this little gadget? Just O of n, right? Yeah. So this is going to be approximately an O of n size circuit, but we're going to have one for each row of the truth table. So this is going to be 2 to the n of them. So we're going to have 2 to the n of these circuits for each row of the truth table. There's, uh, two, yeah, and there's each one is about O of n size. So this is going to be O of n times 2 to the n, right? Kind of a messy construction, an ugly construction, but certainly it's a construction at all. We have created, given an arbitrary Boolean formula, a Circuit, okay, is that that's not a good construction, but it is construction. How much better do you think we can, can do? What do you? What would you conjecture given an arbitrary Boolean formula with the smallest circuit that can represent it is? Two to the n. Two to the n. I'll tell you, it's a little bit smaller than that. Only, but only a little bit. This guy Lupinov in 1950, and most of the theorems we do today are like. 50s theorems and rather than 70s and 80s theorems. Lupinov, 1952, uh, proved that circuits, uh, you can give an arbitrary Boolean formula, you can construct a, uh, construct a circuit of size 2 to the n over n. OK? Not that much smaller, honestly. Just a little bit. But still pretty big. Um, and like we immediately notice a difference between like polynomial time versus arbitrary circuits, right? We said if anything that has an efficient computation has to have an efficient size circuit. But if you consider arbitrary Boolean formulas, they have big circuits usually. In fact, and it stood for like maybe a day even that this was an open question. Can you do better than this? And the first non-constructive lower bound will prove. So this was an upper bound. We'll provide a matching lower bound today by Claude Shannon that proved most circuits require 2 to the n over n size. Most circuits, most Boolean functions have exponential size circuits. That, I think, is, again, contrary. Efficient time has efficient circuits, but most Boolean functions require exponential size circuits. Those two theorems do not contradict each other. Um, most Boolean functions require exponential size circuits. That's what we'll prove next. We'll prove Shannon's theorem next. The way the proof will work, it'll be non-constructive. What we're going to do is just sort of estimate the amount of Boolean circuits of a certain size and estimate the amount of Boolean functions. And then we'll just show that there are way too many functions in circuits. And so certainly not all of them can have small circuits. There are way more functions in circuits. Right? Questions on this before we begin, that, that proof? It's kind of fascinating that, like, not only do we, here's another interesting thing, and we'll talk about explicit constructions in a second. Most circuits will require exponential size circuits. Most Boolean functions require exponential size circuits. We do not have a single example of an explicit Boolean function family such that that, that Boolean function family requires exponential size circuits. This is the only non-constructive proof that we have, but we don't have an explicit function that requires exponential circuits. So crazy duality here, here uh, duality here. Um, the we'll proceed with Shannon's proof if there's no questions on the, the impact or the importance of this theorem. Uh, just to, re to re re restate this, Lupinov proves this uh, upper bound, and then Shannon in the 50s as well proves this matching lower bound. Okay. 
we're going to proceed by a counting argument, right? So what is a, uh, first let's estimate this, how many Boolean circuits are there of size t? And then we'll replace t with 2 to the n over n and do our computer accounting. So how many Boolean circuits are there of size t? And then we'll replace t appropriately. So let's just try to estimate the number of Boolean circuits of size t. And again, Boolean circuits of size t is a, um, a, a circuit of t gates. So let's suppose you have n inputs uh, and t gates. Let's fix a gate, and we're going to do some combinatorics. Let's fix a gate and consider uh, the possibilities here. If you fix a gate, how many choices do you have for that specific gate? Assuming they'll need the three basic gates. Yeah. Well, let's say it's the basis, certainly. So let's just do, let's just call it B. You have, you have the size of B possible choices, okay? Sometimes the basis is done as all possible Boolean functions of two inputs. So you don't just do and or not. You do all, you have a, a basis of how big. How many Boolean functions are there on two, two bits? Pop quiz. Sixteen, truth table of zero zero one zero zero one one one, four bits on the output. All possible bit strings of length four is two to the sixteen. Right, so a lot of Boolean functions will turn out. Now, for every circuit gate gate in the circuit, it has possible inputs that can be wired from something. Those inputs can be what? They can either be another gate, they can be an input, but they cannot be the same gate. You cannot wire a, a circuit's input back to itself, right? In general, a, a circuit is formally defined as an acyclic, a labeled acyclic directed graph, right? So the possible input wires are going to be n plus t minus 1 for both of them, okay? So if we consider that we had this many choices for each gate, we have how many possibilities per gate we're going to have b to the t, because we have t gates, uh, times n plus t minus 1 squared to the t, right? This is an upper bound on the number of possible circuits that we have so far, right? You should notice, though, we've actually significantly overcounted. We considered the, the uh, circuit to be in some fixed topological ordering, excuse me, in a fixed ordering of gates, gate 1, gate 2, gate 3. But in fact, the circuit is a topological object. So it can be drawn on the plane or whatever, right? It's up to permutations of the gates, the labelings of the gates, in fact. So we've overcounted by exactly a certain factor, which is what? N factorial. Yeah, well, it's going to be t factorial for t, t for the number of gates, right? So we've actually overcounted by t factorial, OK? Now, here's what I was talking about Sterling's approximation earlier. Sterling's approximation, anyone remember it? 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Oh, I was saying it's not 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Oh, it's no. just two, 2 pi t, uh, t over e to the t, right? Which is basically like big O of t to the t, OK? Um, let's plug in Sterling's approximation. And we're going to get that this is approximately, um, make sure I got my math right here. We're going to get b to the t. Um, t plus n minus 1 to the 2t, uh, e to the t over uh, t to the t. t to the t, square root of 2 pi t. Okay, double check me. Sounds good, right? Um, there is a relationship among n and t. What is the relationship in n and t? N, number of inputs, T, number of gates. What do we know about the relationship between N and T? Upper bound of phi, 2 to the N over N. Or wait. Forget the 2 to the N over N part for now. 
just in every possible circuit, there's a relationship between the number of gates and the number of inputs. You need one gate per two inputs, right? So in fact, there's a relationship between gates and inputs. And in fact, you can say that the number of gates must be greater than n minus 1, right? Just by the, the, the obvious wiring, right? And look, we got an n minus 1 there. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that this is upper bounded by um, uh, b to the t, uh, 2t to the 2t, e to the t over t to the t, square root of 2 pi t. Do we agree? OK. Um, what is, let's combine some terms here. Uh, we're going to have uh, 4, uh, 4 e size of b t to the t over uh, square root of 2 pi t. OK. The t to the t on the bottom cancels out with this t to the 2t on the top. You're going to have t to the 2t minus t, which is t to the t. So you're going to be left with a t to the t on the top. You're going to have a 4, the 2t there, so it's going to be fine, right? This, is, this, this works out. Question of the arithmetic so far. Asymptotically, how does this grow, though? This is what we'd say, like, what is the big O of this? Fast. I'll just say it's t to the t. Constant, 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 square root of t. Okay. This is upper bounded by some constant c times t to the t. Qualms or uh, argue arguments about that. The number of Boolean function, the number of Boolean circuits on t gates is less than some constant times uh, t to the power t. The number of circuits on T gates is less than this. Let's compute the following then. Uh, how many, uh, what's the number of uh, Boolean circuits of uh, 2 to the n over n gates? And what is the number of Boolean functions? of n inputs. OK. What we're going to do is we're going to take this ratio of the number of Boolean circuits of 2 to the n over n gates. We're going to have a number of Boolean circuits. We're going to have a number of Boolean functions. We're going to take the limit of this ratio and show it goes, to, it goes to 0. By showing this goes to 0, that means the denominator is bigger than the numerator. It means there's way more functions than there are circuits. So not all of them are allowed to have circuits of size 2 to the n over n. By Lupinov's construction, it means that they all have that size. They can't be any smaller. Most of them can't be any smaller. There must exist functions that cannot be smaller. Right? Um, let's plug in 2 to the n over n for t to the t here. We're going to get that this is strictly less than c to the 2 to the n over n to the 2 to the n over n. Right? All divide by how many Boolean functions are there on n inputs? 2 to the 2 to the n. The, a Boolean function is characterized by a 2 to the n length string. How many st bit strings are there of length 2 to the n? 2 to the 2 to the n. So this is going to be over 2 to the 2 to the n, like that. OK? Um, we also, why are we allowed to just like get rid of the exponential term? Like the 4a to the size of b to the t? Because that's like. Oh, I think I mess made a mistake. Give me a second. This should be c to the. That should be that. Makes more sense. That makes more sense. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so 
So now let's simplify this top. We, I'm just going to simplify the top, OK? We have uh, ct to the t is equal to uh, c to the 2n over n, 2 to the n over n, which is equal to, let's work this out. We're going to have c over n to the 2 to the n over n times uh, our 2 to the n term, which is going to be 2 to the uh, n to the power of uh, 2 to the n over n, right? What is 2 to the n to the 2 to the n over n, right? That n and that n are going to cancel. We're going to be left with uh, c over n times 2 to the 2 to the n over n. And this is simply going to be 2 to the 2 to the n, right? That's the number of Boolean functions. So our ratio then is going to be this value divided by 2 to the 2 to the n. So our ratio is going to be uh, c over n to the 2 to the n over n over, uh, excuse me, times 2 to the 2 to the n, divided by 2 to the 2 to the n, OK? Which is then simply going to be equal to c over n times 2 to the n over n. What is the limit as you take this to 0? Excuse me, limit as you take n to infinity. That's going to get real small. That's going to get real big. 2 to the n over n grows, grows big. c over n grows small. So in fact, when you take the limit of this, what is this going to be? Yeah, the limit of this will equal 0. Shannon's non-constructive argument, the Shannon-Muller theorem. There are way more Boolean functions than there are Boolean circuits of size 2 to the n over n. So in fact, Lupinov's construction is in fact uh, asymptotic. It's in fact like uh, optimal. Kind of a devastating theorem, though, because it means we can't arbitrary Boolean functions can't be done in small circuits. There's, of course, such a Kolmogorov argument in this favor, right? There are way more functions than there are circuits. Not every, not every uh, function can be compressed into a small circuit. But in fact, what defines a small circuit is bigger than we would like. It's still big. It's really big. This proves that most functions, most Boolean functions, do not have small circuits, or even sub-exponential circuits. It's crazy. Questions on this construct on this proof? A little bit of counting and combinatorics involved, and we took some liberties, but that's okay because we upper bounded everything. The great part about doing inequalities instead of equality work is I don't have to care. It's just a bigger number. If it still goes to 0, it's, it's still 0, right? Um, questions? OK, now um, we gave a non-constructive lower bound on uh, most functions. This is a non-constructive lower bound on Boolean functions. Can I give you an example of a family of, uh, of an example of a family of Boolean functions that require a certain amount of circuits? I, what I'm trying to say is an explicit uh, Boolean function family that requires a certain amount of circuits. And in fact, I can. I can give you exactly one. Uh, before I do, I'll, I'll talk about the history of it. Uh, we have basically proved zero. Uh, given an explicit function, we have proven zero. Uh, Circuit lower bounds on any functions. We have nothing. We don't have anything. Um, there was there's a result from the 80s that was the best known lower bound on an explicit Boolean function family, um, and it was I have it here. It was from 1983. They proved uh, 3n minus little o of n. A little o of n is some term that grows up to n, but always less than it, right? 3 of n minus little o of n is an explicit lower bound, circuit lower bound, on the number of gates required by a certain Boolean function family, OK? Then finally, this was improved in 20, you're not going to believe this, 2016, somebody found a better lower bound. Uh, it was uh, not much better, though. You won't believe this. It took all this work to prove a lower bound of 3 plus 1 over 86 86 to the n minus little o of n, OK? So maybe four decades of life and births and deaths occur for us to improve this lower bound by 
a perhaps a rounding error in terms, you know. And I'll tell you this explicit Boolean function family is called affine dispersers. So it's non-trivial. Uh, it's nothing interesting. Um, but we were able to prove a circuit lower bound on the Boolean functions that compute affine dispersers of that size. Now, I'm going to be able to give you an explicit Boolean function, a lower bound, on an explicit uh, function family in a second. But I just want to mention that as a, as a community, we've basically failed. The theorists have basically completely failed to prove circuit lower bounds. The motivation behind going into circuits in general to begin with was, was the fact that they are usually inductive. A circuit for a larger n may contain a subcircuit for a smaller n. Right? That sounds reasonable depending on exactly what the function is. And it's, it'll be true for the function we'll do right now. Uh, so the, the, the internal structure of a circuit not only avoids the relativization barrier, but appears you would think would have simple proofs on the induction on the, induction on the size of the circuit. It turns out not really no. Uh, um, so I'm going to give you the only known uh, like easy proof of this. Let threshold of k of uh, n uh, map n bits uh, to one bit. Basically, it's the threshold function is like if uh, greater than or equal to k of its n bits are a 1, right? Simple function. It's not even a majority function or anything. If k of its n bits are, it has n inputs. If at least k of them are a 1, then it uh, is a 1. It's an output's a 1, right? It just counts the number of bits it has and it outputs a 1. Um, The best lower bound we have on this specific one is uh, the, the threshold. The threshold functions uh, for two to the n uh, requires circuits of size two uh, n uh, minus four. Now, in fact, they require much bigger circuits, approximately three n minus little o of n. But it's good enough, right? For the proof, we'll prove that. Threshold function on n inputs such that only two of them, only two of them are ones, or at least two of them are ones, requires two to the n minus four uh, gates. Any questions on what we're about to prove before we jump into the proof? Okay. Um, we proceed by induction. What is the base case? Well, if n equals 1, then you have negative 2 gates. Okay. Fair enough. Yes? There are 2 gates. Or, sorry, there are 2. 2 inputs? Yeah. n equals 2? Yeah. n equals 2 requires 0. I actually don't know how to do this. One of the proofs of this I said the base cases were n equals 2 and n equals 3. And I couldn't figure out what it meant by n equals 2. Because n equals 2, you, have, you just make sure those 2 bits are on. But... How does that take a circuit of size 0? Oh, let me specify. Suppose our basis is B2, uh, which is uh, 16 possible Boolean functions of two inputs, right? So you have, for uh, your input, you have all 16 possible Boolean functions on two inputs. You have two, every gate here is two inputs and one output wire, right? Is that more like a group or something somehow, like composition? I don't know if a Boolean function, well, a Boolean function has two inputs but one output. So they're not invertible. I think uh, reversible computation, when you study like quantum circuits and stuff, they must. The inverses are well-defined and so on. The computation inherently is destructive. right? It's information is not preserved. Yeah. So something like that happens. Yeah. Um, base case, I don't know about n equals 2. I couldn't figure it out. I think it's 3. n equals 3. If we have n equals 3, base case n equals 3, consider the threshold function of two inputs of three gates. Uh, uh, excuse me, three input wires, but two of them must be majority. Um, and two times three uh, minus four is equal to two. And uh, notice all two input, two gate uh, circuits are wrong. Oh, excuse me, all, excuse me, all one gate circuits are wrong. So, uh, the size of the circuit, the size of the circuit must be greater than or equal to two. 
all one gate circuits are incorrect. So threshold of two bits of n inputs, of three inputs, uh, two of three must be greater than or equal to two. Now, uh, what is an explicit construction of, let's actually just work through it. Give me, let's, let's work through an explicit construction of three input wires. Such that the three input wires um, have a one output wire if two of the three bits are one. How would we, like, just in general, think about a construction of this? Maybe I could have left this as an exercise in my homework because I think it's fun to. I think it's a fun problem. I enjoyed working this one. Don't maybe consider the number of gates. Just give me any circuit using andors and nots. Forget the boolean function part too. Andors and nots. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, just using however many it takes. Just and each pair, and then or that end result. Sum of products. I actually don't think there's a two-gate circuit using even base the 16 circuit basis. I think this is like the smallest one. But it doesn't matter because 5 is greater than 2, QED. Um, questions on this? The base case is good? OK. Let's prove the induction hypothesis. Let's, let's assume the induction hypothesis. And let's prove, uh, let's consider a circuit of n gates. Excuse me. Uh, let's, let's assume we have a, a circuit computing threshold of n uh, of Tn over 2. So consider we have some circuit. Uh, let's say, suppose C computes a uh, uh, threshold of two inputs on of two of uh, two of n. Okay. So we have some large circuit here. Who knows how its wiring is occurring? But we have inputs x1, x2. And these are wired in somehow, right? Uh, let's consider this last circuit, this last gate G, OK? Without loss of generality, we may assume that the last gate G is connected to two distinct inputs. Let's call them xi and xj. Do we agree? Suppose G is con connected to two of those gates, right? Uh, here's a small lemma we'll prove first. One of xi or xj is connected, is an input to another gate. Any other gate, right? Uh, here's how we're going to prove it. Suppose we removed. Uh, G, suppose, uh, assume, assume to the contrary, both uh, G1, excuse me, both Xi, Xj only connect to uh, G, this gate G, OK? Let's hard code the possible values of Xi and Xj, right? Um, if xi and xj are zeros and zeros and, and uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. What s f Boolean function should, should c minus g compute? Let's say we, uh, if, we har if we hard code c, if we hard code xi and xj, we now have an n minus 2 bit Boolean function, right? What do they compute if they're both 0?
I suppose, let me, maybe I'll do one for, for us. What I'm trying to say is like if xi and xj are both zero, we can ignore them in the computation and the remaining circuit has to compute the threshold function of two bits of n minus two inputs, right? By, by correctness. Um, what about if these, are, these occur, if either of these occur, if one of them is one, these compute threshold of one input on n minus two, and if both these occur, it's going to be threshold of zero on n minus two, right? So if we fix xi and xj, then there are three possible Boolean functions that the remaining circuit computes correctly, okay? But if we fix xi, xj, just fix the output of gate g. If you fix the output of gate g, it's the same as fixing the inputs of uh, xi and xj, right? But if you fix the output of gate g, this is two possible circuits. C minus G, where C minus G is where we hard code and fix uh, that output. C minus G is two possible circuits. So C minus G is two possible circuits, but yet it must compute three possible Boolean functions. Contradiction. Let's make sure we understand the, 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 the proof there. This is a little lemma. Xi must connect to some other gate, right? OK. We get it? Get it? OK. So we know, without loss of generality, one of Xi, Xj must connect to another gate. Let's just suppose it's X, Xi. So we're going to have another gate G prime here. And we're going to have, let's Xi, suppose Xi goes to this other gate G prime, whatever that gate may be. Uh, if, you, uh, if you set xi to uh, be 0 and uh, remove c, uh, g, and g prime, uh, what Boolean function does c minus g minus g prime compute? Is a, c minus g minus g prime is a circuit where we have fixed one of its inputs. So then this g is only dependent on one of its inputs, so we can just do something with that. c minus g minus g prime computes what Boolean function? I'll give you a hint, it's a threshold function. Which threshold function is it? The threshold of 2 n minus 1? Yes. C minus g minus g prime computes the threshold function of 2 n minus 1. n minus 1, 2 of n minus 1, right? By the induction hypothesis, uh, the size of C minus g minus g prime must be greater than what? Two n minus one plus four, which is two n minus two, two n plus two. Hmm? Minus four third plus four nine. Oh. Man, it it ends up not being needed, but because the base case made more sense. Oh, okay. Were you stuck on that? I don't know. It did bother me. Like it did. Wait. Ah, it's supposed to be plus four. Wait, yeah, it's plus four. It's supposed to be plus four the whole way. Okay. Wait, that, that that definitely can't make sense then, because for, now it only takes five gates for you to do three. And it takes maybe it is no, maybe it's minus four. Maybe it's minus four. I think it's minus. No, it's got to be minus four. It's got to be minus four. Yeah, I was right. I was right. It's minus four. It's minus four. Okay, okay. 
I made one accidental mistake at the end here. Okay. If C, if the, if the circuit of size C minus G minus G prime is greater than or equal to 2N minus 1 plus 4, minus 4, what is the size of C then? Well, you removed exactly two gates. So just add those two gates back in. You're going to add those two gates back in to get plus 2, which is going to give you 2n minus 4, as desired. An explicit lower bound on a Boolean function. Wow. Questions on this proof? Yes? Does it matter that we set xi to be 0 and not 1? It works for the proof, because then this would be threshold of 1 n minus 1. We don't get an induction hypothesis for that case. So uh, let me just give you a sort of brief history of like how does, how, what happened um, in the 80s. So this is, a, an ex, this is an explicit lower bound on uh, a Boolean function. But it's not good. Okay, This is a 2n size lower bound. It's not even n squared. It's not even 3n. It's 2n. Okay. We tried really hard for like a decade to find, after the relativization barrier, attention was brought back to circuits. Like circuits had been done um, by electrical engineers, and they didn't really care about the combinatorics simply because they're too busy doing Fourier transforms or whatever, you know? So like circuit complexity was not something that they studied the same way the combinatorialists did at the time. So a generation of complexity theorists went into the minds, so to speak, of circuit complexity trying to figure out how this works. And finally, a result came out in 1981. It took a long time for such a result to be published, but it was by uh, first Sachs and Sipser. That's Merrick first, who's floating around the department somewhere. Sachs is the guy who invented the master's theorem, and Sipser wrote the book we use, right? So first Sachs, Sipser, 1981, 1984, I don't remember. They prove uh, the first non-trivial circuit lower bound that isn't something stupid, like this threshold function, okay? Um, they proved the parity function. Parity is a function which takes on n input bits and XORs them, okay? That's the Boolean function. It's just like even or odd ones, right? Um, they proved parity is not in a circuit class called AC0. Now, AC0, let's not get too technical, but it's uh, uniform circuits. Circuits. It's got polynomial, poly, uh, polynomial gates, and it's constant depth. And by uniform circuits, what I mean here is, I'm just going through markers. Uniform circuits. Um, basically mean that each gate has unbounded fan in. Like a uniform circuit is one, if you want to or a bunch of things together, you don't need to, or and a bunch of things together, you don't need to make an and tree. You can simply just do one of these. That's allowed in a uniform circuit. Each, uh, that's a gate that's allowed, right? And it basically, if, the AC0 is an interesting study because you want to, it maybe studies more about like the complexity of a problem than the number of gates of a fixed fan in. Because if you have a fixed fan in, then you're like, well, it's now my measure is a function of the number of ands I, and the number of bits I needed. This really studies, if you have a lot of ands close together, they're just one big and, right? So it really studies the kind of like alternating ands and ors and nots and things like this, right? AC0, by the way, stupid class, ridiculously trivially small class. Parity of ridiculously simple and small Boolean function. Proving, oh, excuse me, parity not in AC0 took the development of this new technique called the randomized restriction. The randomized restriction, uh, I don't even want to get involved with how hard this technique is. Basically, they use a probabilistic method on, a cir on circuits to show that if you were to restr restrict some of its Boolean inputs, consider a probability distribution on, on it, you know, uh, it requires, you, the, 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 the circuit is wrong in a certain sense. It requires a super polynomial amount of gates, right? So this was a foundational result because it was the first like non-trivial circuit lower bound. Um, and then several papers came out like uh, Yao uh, and, and then John Hastad was able to prove what's called the Hastad switching lemma, which is that any function that computes parity in constant depth requires exponentially many gates. And again, 
exponential, excuse me, constant depth is a really, really bad lower bound. In uniform computation, most algorithms have a linear time lower bound because it takes that long to read the input. So what does it even mean if depth in our construction corresponds to the time the machine takes? Proving a constant depth lower bound on such a simple function is not something I would think that should be celebrated, but this was probably the most important result of the decade. People then took this technique and they refined it and they updated it and they optimized it, right? And we got several interesting results in this regard, but they were only on simple functions, okay? Threshold, very simple function, Boolean function to describe, right? And notice how we did the induction inside the, inside the circuit. Uh, parity, right? The parity function also contains as a subcircuit the parity function, right? Um, majority is another simple one, right? And people tried to hopefully show you know, something non-trivial about, um, about these uh, circuits. And then like in like the mid-80s, Rasborov was able to prove that clique has a super polynomial monotone circuit. A monotone circuit is one that has no knock not gates. And by the way, if a, if a circuit has no not gates, you may always satisfy the circuit by simply setting every wire to one, right? So they proved, and I won't get too in the details about monotone complexity or anything like this, but he, Rasborov was able to prove clique has super polynomial monotone circuit. That's very important because clique is NP complete, right? If um, the, whole, the whole holy grail of this era was attempting to prove that SAT could not be in P slash poly. Because if SAT did not, if, if SAT could not be done in polynomial size circuits, that was a roundabout way around the, that was literally the path around the relativization barrier. Circuit theorems do not appear to relativize. If SAT is not in P slash poly, NP is not in P slash poly, and therefore N does not, P does not equal NP. Um, anyway, Rasborov's method for showing this ended up, uh, he, the next very next paper, people got very excited about this, but the very next paper was like, if you throw in not gates, the whole proof doesn't work anymore. The whole thing doesn't work. So his whole technique he developed was monotone specific, unfortunately. Um, there was several eras of papers in this, and they all, Rasborov proved this, he also proved something else interesting, which was that uh, every theorem that they had kind of, every paper kind of did the same thing, right? Parity, not an AC0, by the way, I'll describe another proof of it that people did which is basically you say uh, AC0 uh, is, a, uh, uh, is approximated by low degree polynomials. Then you say, sat, uh, then you say uh, the parity requires a high degree polynomials. And such a proof would be sufficient to show that parity would not be an AC0. And every, every single proof of this era basically went through the same kind of thing. Like AC0 approximated by low degree polynomials. I won't expand about what that means. But every paper did basically uh, something. You First off, you define, a, uh, define a, a, some sort of measure. Define like uh, some of these were s like scatter. Um, uh, discrepancy, uh, variation, sensitivity, uh, density, and so on, right? You can, you say, oh, I'm going to define this measure on circuits or Boolean functions, right? The Boolean function, maybe it has a certain property. And the goal was to sort of sh uh, show uh, that uh, P slash poly has a low, let's say, discrepancy. But SAT requires high discrepancy. So this was like a proof strategy. I'm not, no one actually did this. Man, I'm running out of markers. This is, no one actually did this. This is just a, simply a proof strategy of People proving circuit lower bounds attempted to prove uh, P does not equal NP. 
And it worked for very simple functions and very simple classes. But think about what a Boolean circuit for SAT looks like. Okay? You can convert a brute force search algorithm from SAT into a Boolean sized circuit for SAT, but that would be an exponential that would be an exponential size circuit. Consider what a circuit even has to do to solve SAT, right? How would that even how would that computation even work? Certainly, whatever circuit solves SAT has decides SAT has to be far more complicated than the functions we've just find. The majority function, excuse me, the threshold function, and then parity, right? Um, and Rasborov and Rudich called these kinds of proofs naturalizing. They called these proofs natural proofs, right? And basically what they did was this whole class of proofs in this whole era of the 1980s, up until like 1995, 1997, what they basically proved is that P does not equal NP has no natural proof. So maybe 15, 20 years went the development of very rigorous Boolean uh, function analysis of circuit complexity was developed, and all the techniques seem to have this naturalizing property. And I won't get too explicit about what that is, but basically, as Ben Rubich showed, P does not equal NP has no natural proof. Here's, here's sort of the outline. Uh, from cryptography, we, didn't, we don't know this, but other people know that if P does not equal NP, then that implies uh, um, pseudo random, pseudo random uh, number generators cannot be distinguished. from true randomness. So if you set up a little game where someone has true randomness and someone has pseudo-randomness and you're trying to tell them apart, no polytime randomized efficient algorithm can tell them apart uh, unless p, if and only if p does not equal np. Right? So we know we can say pseudo-random number generators exist if p does not equal np. Perhaps you should believe that. If p equals np, turns out you can tell them apart. Um, Next, they, next, that's just some prior knowledge. Then they said if P does not, uh, if P does not equal NP, has a natural proof. The proof can distinguish between uh, pseudo, pseudo random uh, number generators and true randomness. And if you can distinguish between pseudo-random number generators and true randomness, that in turn implies P equals NP, right? So basically, unlike the relativization barrier, this was the second great arc in uh, complexity theory. 15, 20, uh, 25 years of people's hard work in this area ended up being kind of worthless overnight when these guys announced this result. Uh, if your proof looks natural, and basically all of them look natural, then the natural, uh, natural proof would not be able to solve um, P from NP. Let me give you the chart one last time. Any questions on natural proofs? We won't get at all deep into it. It's very complex. Even a proof of eight parity not an AC0, I think, would take us two lectures. And I don't care enough. Right? It's hard combinatorics for us to talk about and not do. Right. So here's the history of the P versus NP problem. And this is like how close we are to solving it. And this is time. So Cook announces the problem in 1971. And there, confidence only goes up because he, he thinks we can solve it. And then the relativization barrier comes out in 1975. And it's over. And like the relativization barrier says, you know, no relativizing proof can solve P equals NP or P does not equal NP, right? Uh, and then there was a very short time where people thought maybe the problem is independent of, of set theory or something. And there was a few results in this era, but nothing major. And then finally, several decades come. Uh, 1981, we have first Sachs and Sipser. They finally prove a, a useful circuit lower bound on something. And this was, by the way, 1975 was the Baker, Gill, and Solovey result. Right? And then finally, interest comes up. And they, people are really convinced that, okay, the, the relativization barrier, that doesn't really matter. Because uh, the random restriction method was very powerful. It seemed there was a lot of good theory here. Rasborov proves a lower, brown, a lower bound on clique. He shows it doesn't work for uh, if you add a not gates. And then finally, we uh, have the natural proof barrier. And this is Rasborov and Rudich in 19, uh, 1997. And then it's over. It's totally over. Um, and then there were some other techniques that had been developed at the time. And 
one of them involved like uh, the polynomial method and, and, and such things. We won't talk about these, but know that even for such a simple method, uh, we found a barrier to that as well. It's over. So what do we have left? This is like 2006. What do we have left? We, we have essentially nothing and nothing. Nothing falls into, we have proven no circuit lower bounds, essentially. Today, the title of today's lecture is on circuit lower bounds. We have a non-constructive proof that most circuits require 2 to the n over n gates. We gave a linear lower bound on an explicit, extremely simple function that can perform induction very simply. Um, we don't have even a quadratic lower bound. We have nothing, an n log n lower bound. We have no circuit lower bounds at all. And we've tried and failed to prove circuit lower bounds. We tried and failed relativizing techniques. And then there are other methods and other such barriers. We have no techniques left to prove p does not equal np. So the circuit complexity, circuit complexity was developed to try to avoid a barrier but it hit its own barrier. And other techniques were developed to avoid certain barriers, and they hit their own barriers as well. So we're running out of things to do. We know very well what techniques will not solve a problem. That doesn't help us say which techniques will solve a problem. We have no idea how to do it. To contrast the two, I'll say that relativization is double-sided, but uh, the natural proofs barrier is single-sided. Natural proofs only say that you can't prove P does not equal NP using a naturalizing proof. And that's the more important direction, because we don't think p equals np. We have good evidence that that's not true. Uh, and such a technique also doesn't even help show the two things to be equal, right? So, questions on this? Natural proof barrier, have you given up hope? Uh, questions? All right.